On May 28, 2020, President Trump issued an executive order called the Executive Order on Preventing Online Censorship. Does this order risk abridging your First Amendment rights? Well, today we're going to talk about the executive order and the law it addresses and what it means for you. Coming up on Legal Bites. So before I get into the executive order itself, I want to first set the table by talking about the law that's in place, the law that the executive order is actually aimed at. So, and in order to do that, I kind of need to go back just a little bit further to talk about the legal landscape that existed before that legislation was enacted. Before the internet existed, there really were only a few avenues for information about current events, chief among them, newspapers and TV news channels. Now, as I'm sure you're aware, newspapers editorialize their content, meaning they screen their articles long before they ever get published for accuracy and for other quality checks. One reason for why they screen it is because if they were to publish an article about someone and that article ends up being false or having false information and that false information ends up causing harm to the reputation of that person, the newspaper itself could also be liable for defamation. While defamation is a tort claim that can vary from state to state, generally speaking, there are four main elements that a plaintiff would have to prove in order to show defamation. Number one, they'd have to show that the defendant made a statement of fact, and they'd have to show that that statement of fact was false. Then they'd also have to show that the statement of fact was published, meaning that it was made to a third party. And finally, they'd have to show that the publication of that statement actually caused harm to the reputation of that person. Defamation includes libel, which is defamation in a permanent form, meaning in writing, for example. And it also includes slander, which is spoken. So note that the newspaper is being held liable for something that another individual did, meaning the author wrote the article that had a false statement. That's called secondary liability. It's liability that attaches to a person or to an entity when someone else performed a certain harmful conduct, but where they played some sort of a role somehow, where they had some, some responsibility in ensuring that that harmful conduct doesn't actually happen. So for a newspaper, for example, the newspaper has a certain amount of control over the articles and the quality of the articles that it publishes. With that control comes a certain responsibility to make sure that the content is not harmful. When the internet came around, now you had everyday people who were able to create their own platform and reach increasingly large audiences through websites, chat rooms, and eventually social media. One consequence of that development is that information is being spread after being user generated as opposed to coming from an, ed an editorial board which is able to screen that information. Now on the one hand, this user generated content is great when it comes to genuine self-expression and uh, uh, accurate on the ground reporting. However, uh, the question started to come up of what happens when user generated content is aimed to defame, harass, expose, or otherwise harm other users or other people. Who's to be held responsible for that? Even before social media platforms like Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram were created, courts were trying to wrestle with this question. And the case law that developed in the 1990s really started to hinge on something called editorial control. So just like what we were talking about with the newspaper, so if a website or an internet provider was exercising on a general basis more editorial control, uh, then they would be treated more like a newspaper publisher and have more liability. On the other hand, if there was a website or an internet provider that was not exercising as much editorial control on a general basis, they would be treated more as a distributor of the content. So as opposed to the newspaper publisher that's, uh, that's editorializing, then on the other hand, you have someone treated more like the newspaper stand out on the street. This obviously created a dilemma when it came to offensive or harmful content and it started to look like one of two extreme conclusions were going to happen. On the one hand, you either had a 
harmful and offensive content that stays on the internet forever because you have websites that are fearful of taking down any content because then they would be considered as moderating that content. Then on the other hand, you had internet providers that would choose to moderate, but then come down hard on any and all comments that are even remotely offensive. Neither scenario is particularly great. So in 1996, Congress passed Section 509 of the Communications Decency Act, which was later codified as 47 U.S. Code Section 230. I'm going to refer to it as Section 230 just for shorthand for the rest of this video. This is the law that many credit as having basically given way to the internet in general, and in particular to social media platforms like Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Instagram. So what does section 230 say? Well, the meat of it is in section 230 subdivision C, which has two parts. The first part says that no provider or user of an interactive computer service is to be treated as the publisher or speaker of any information provided by another information content provider. In other words, if Joe Schmo were to get into a nasty breakup with his girlfriend and then post defamatory content about her on his brother Bob Schmo's Facebook wall, the only person that would be held liable for that is Joe Schmo, not Facebook and not Bob. The second part talks about civil liability in taking down content. Specifically, it says that no provider or user of an interactive computer service will be held liable for two types of action taken in good faith. The first action is restricting access to or availability of material that the provider or the user considers to be obscene, lewd, lascivious, filthy, excessively violent, harassing, or otherwise objectionable, whether or not such material is constitutionally protected, or actions enabling or making available the means to restrict access to that kind of material. For example, Facebook giving you the ability to delete a comment or a post that's on your wall. Taken together, these two sections mean that if Facebook or Twitter or other online social media platforms were to uh, become aware of some content that is harmful or offensive, they wouldn't be held liable in taking down that material. And they also wouldn't be held liable for other content just because they have a regular habit of taking down that kind of material as well. It's important to note that the language that's used in the statute is very broad and confers a very powerful immunity for online platforms. In particular, the fact that a platform can take down content because it is otherwise objectionable means that it can take down content for reasons outside of what's specifically listed in the statute. For example, content that's lewd or lascivious or harassing. The only requirement is that it's objectionable, which some people would say can be kind of subjective. And another important thing to note is that the immunity from liability also extends to constitutional claims, which is a very powerful shield. And case law has confirmed the wide breadth of this immunity, and not just for cases that are for defamation. From defamation to false information to negligence over sexually explicit content to even terrorism, courts have, for the most part, upheld secondary liability uh, immunity for these social media platforms and other internet providers. Okay, so that brings us to the executive order itself. The policy section of the executive order goes to talk a lot about the importance of free speech under the First Amendment and the fact that social media platforms like Facebook and Twitter and YouTube and Instagram have grown so large and that they now hold a lot of power in shaping uh, public discourse and shaping interpretation of public events um, and determining what people do or do not see. It also talks a lot about claims of political bias and moderating the content and determining what people do or don't see based on the particular viewpoint of the person that is uh, generating that content and sometimes with or without justification based on the terms of service. It also touches on claims that have been made about some platforms cooperation with foreign governments and hiding human rights abuses or spreading propaganda and misinformation abroad. But in terms of what it actually does in practical terms, there's no real immediate effect for social media platforms or for its users. It mostly directs it, the executive agencies and departments to take certain actions. 
For example, it directs the National Telecommunications and Information Administration to file a petition for rulemaking with the Federal Communications Commission to clarify the good faith portion of Section 230. The executive order also seems to be giving examples of what it thinks are probably activities that are not made in good faith. For example, situations where a platform might be taking actions that are deceptive, pretextual, or inconsistent with a platform's terms of service, or where a platform fails to give a reasoned explanation to the user for taking down content, um, or for not giving a meaningful opportunity to be heard in taking down that content as well. Then it also directs the National Telecommunications and Information Administration to look into what kind of circumstances in which a platform is not taking certain actions in good faith could uh, cause them to have their immunity removed. It also directs the Federal Trade Commission and the Attorney General to work in separate groups related to enforcement of the laws uh, concerning deceptive and unfair practices related to an online platform's public representations of their practices. And finally, it directs the Attorney General to propose federal legislation to promote the policies of the executive order. My overall impression of the executive order is that it's probably has the end goal of creating legislation that's going to amend Section 230 in order to limit the liability immunity for online platforms, particularly maybe in one or two ways. Uh, the first way is probably to create the ability for constitutional claims to be heard against them. I mean, it talks about the First Amendment a lot. And secondly, it talks a lot about how the immunity related to taking content down should be interpreted narrowly. Particularly, uh, it talks about how the good faith element should really be the focus of any kind of analysis in determining whether or not an online provider is entitled to that immunity. So if I had a crystal ball, I would predict that an amendment to Section 230 would probably be aimed at creating some sort of responsibility or some sort of mechanism for putting responsibility on social media platforms in uh, justifying the removal of content in one way or another and to allow constitutional claims to be heard. But then again, all of this could just be political saber rattling. So what do you guys think? Is there going to be some sort of an amendment to Section 230 or a revocation to Section 230? If you have any thoughts on it, put them in the comments below. I hope at the very least that you found this informative. If so, please go ahead and like the video. And if you want to see more videos, go ahead and hit the subscribe button and hit the notification bell so you can see when the next video is coming. Thanks.